Our guest today and you this afternoon is Dr. Lasima Zerbo, who is the very distinguished head of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organisation. He's been in that role since 2013, but previously led the technical verification team within the organisation all the way back to 2004. So in that time, he's had to deal with multiple crises of people breaking out of the non-proliferation regime, particularly the North Koreans. But in the process, has established an absolutely fantastic reputation for technical excellence and real credibility. This is a, an absolutely indispensable multilateral organisation. And Lassimer is here at ANU to give the 2018 John G. Memorial Lecture. John G. being a very extraordinarily distinguished Australian diplomat who was one of the founding fathers of the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Office for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons until his untimely death in 2007. And we're looking forward very much to your speech, your address, your lecture this evening on the subject of the problems of multilateralism and multilateral organisations in this contemporary age, which are legion. But let's begin briefly by telling us a little bit about the state of play with respect to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the prospects for its ratification, and the role that you are nonetheless able to play in your organisation pending that ratification and formally coming into force. Thank you, Gareth, and thank you for uh, inviting me to be at ANU today. Uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, let me say that uh, consists of an international monitoring system, international data center, basically a verification system that uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry called one of the greatest accomplishments of the modern world. But the greatest accomplishment of the modern world with a treaty that is not yet in force. And that's the dilemma we have. So we have a solid uh, technical framework, organizational framework, that is supposed to be, or that is supposed to back a treaty that is not yet in force, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, with eight countries that are basically holding hostage the international community. Uh, those countries are US, China, India, Pakistan, and the DPRK, and Israel, Egypt, and Iran. So among those eight, five have already signed the treaty, and then three haven't touched it. Uh, so those three are the DPRK, India, and Pakistan. So the state of play is, uh, you know, we stall, stuck, and uh, trying to do our best to get those eight countries to join. And we're hoping that uh, opportunities like the DPRK could help the international community move this treaty a little bit forward. We'll come back to the problems of multilateralism generally and specifically in the context of arms control, but perhaps you can say just a little bit more about what makes it possible for your organisation to detect nuclear explosions in small countries far away when there's obviously not the capacity to be there on the ground. Is it seismic? Is it atmospheric releases of chemicals? How, with, with very small scale explosions of the kind we had in the early North Korean testing program, you still seemed able to pin them down. A, you know, we can be pretty confident nobody's getting away with anything these days, can't we? This day, I think we can, and we are. I think there is uh, hardly any explosion. Uh, I mean, in the process to develop nuclear weapon that will go undetected by our international monitoring system and the national technical. How many countries are involved in participating in that monitoring system at the moment? We have uh, around 90 countries that are part of the, I mean, that will host the international monitoring system facility, Australia being the third largest with 21 facilities. And we're here to celebrate the completion of the segment, the Australian segment of the international monitoring system. And what form do those Australian facilities take? They're essentially seismic monitoring? Or? No, with all the four technologies. You have uh, seismic, infrasound, uh, hydroacoustic, and uh, radionuclide. Radionuclide basically sniffing the hair. But uh, with seismic, that's what we do on a regular basis. I mean, consistently looking for any shaking of the ground. And then with uh, hydroacoustic uh, checking, I mean, you guys are, uh, I see Australia, I often say Australia is an island, uh, but I mean, that's what we see on the map, but I mean, it's a continent. Uh, but I mean, you are, uh, you are within uh, the largest part of the ocean on this planet and uh, strategically placed with uh, strategically placed station as well. And uh, hydroacoustic for underwater movement 
and an infrasound for any things that uh, deal with uh, you know air pressure and uh, the radionuclide is a smoking gun of the three other technologies and anything that moves not only in that part of the world but uh, you know all the planet will be detected by our system well, it's a fabulous technical achievement it's a fantastic diplomatic achievement to get that degree of buy-in from so many in the international community but it's also a pretty fantastic achievement to be able to do all this when the treaty is still not into force the parent treaty how have you been able to, how have you been able to get away with that I think basically the preparatory commission that I'm heading uh, I mean still its mission, technically the preparatory commission still technically for, okay. precisely his mission is to prepare the technical means and the political means for the entry into force of the treaty. Technically, by getting ready with all the facilities, supposedly 337 facilities over the four technologies, to be ready for an entry into force that was supposed to be due three years after its opening for signature, meaning by 1999 we should have had the treaty into force. Well, CGBTO is a fantastic example of a multilateral organisation working exactly as it was intended to be, even if more informally than formally. But of course the theme of your talk to us this evening is that multilateralism more generally is under stress and manifestly it is under stress with the arms control regime, with the INF treaty obviously in a very fragile condition at the moment with the Americans threatening to walk away from that bilateral arms control nuclear arms control between the United States and Russia, uh, pretty much dead in the water across a broad front with a real anxiety about the New START treaty coming up for renewal quite soon, and no enthusiasm whatsoever from the nuclear weapon states or the nuclear arms states more generally outside the non-proliferation treaty to show any degree of interest in, um, in nuclear arms control, let alone moving towards serious disarmament. Does that make you very dispirited or is it a function of some structural problems in the international community as we have now evolved or is it just a transient issue associated with particular very difficult personalities and none more difficult of course than President Trump in the United States at the moment? Is it an endemic systemic problem we've got or a, a, one that can make us a little bit more optimistic that it might be just transient? I think it's uh, beyond the personalities of uh, the leaders of today. Uh, it's more of a, a systemic problem with uh, a changing world, changing world with emerging powers, emerging powers around the world. You take India, you take Pakistan, and then there are other countries that are coming along. And uh, as countries are emerging, people feel that uh, domestic security is not there anymore, and then they don't trust each other. I think it's basically a deficit of trust between countries, regionally and internationally. And if you add to that, you know, personal egos, it just doesn't help. So, but in arms control and non-proliferation, this is where, uh, when you talk about stress, the stress is more tangible. I think we're seeing now uh, potentially another arms race. Uh, DPRK is one example. But if we don't deal with DPRK in a way where the international community solves the issue uh, to stop any other t attempt uh, to move into developing nuclear weapon, I think we'll go into a serious arm race that will see things emerging again, not only in this part of the world, but uh, potentially uh, Latin America, even in Asia here. And that's one of the biggest risks that we see today. And we have to work of course, the other big alarm bell that's ringing is over Iran's intentions with America walking away from the manifestly very successful uh, nuclear agreement that was agreed upon some time ago. The JCPOA. Uh, JCPOA, as it's called. Um, how worried are you that Iran is going to break ranks on this in the context of that abdication of responsibility by the United States and how worried are you that that in turn will generate um, preparation pressures elsewhere in the Middle East? My hope is that Iran stays because Iran has strong support internationally with Europe and then the rest of the international community. Uh, my uh, the sad part from me as head of the CTBT 
was that we missed an opportunity with Iran to not bring the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty as part of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Had we done this, I would be the happiest person today because uh, one would see this as an opportunity to get other Annex two countries to join the CTBT. But there is an opportunity still with the support that Europe is giving to Iran, the support that the rest of the international community is giving to Iran, there is room to get Iran to use that trust to, me, to do a further step in arms control and non-proliferation. That further step could be considering the CTBT to win the trust of those who are still hesitating about Iran's intentions. And that's what I'm hoping. Whenever I talk to Iranians, I make very clear my impression that they're occupying the moral high ground at the moment, and they'd be very foolish indeed to walk away from that internationally when they've got so much uh, support in that context. The other thought that has occurred to me, and I'd be fascinated to see what you think, is whether China could in fact be persuaded to play a leadership role when it comes to nuclear disarmament. We're focusing on nuclear weapons because that's your specialty. Uh, given that China, after all, has been you know, a very reluctant starter in many ways in the nuclear arms race. They have a quite small arsenal, much, 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 much smaller than the United States and Russia, as we all know. And they are, of all the nuclear armed states, the only ones that are really seriously committed to no first use, at least at the moment. So my, my hope is that the, um, the Chinese, uh, despite all their nationalist tradition and the chest beating that's going on, might be persuaded to play a, you know, a, a leadership role on this particular critical global public goods issue in the way that they've chosen to play a leadership role on climate change with the abdication by the Americans of leadership there and on free trade issues as well. Is that a totally quixotic uh, hope that the Chinese might be persuaded to, to really pull the pieces together on this in a way that the Russians and Americans are manifestly not keen to do at the moment? I think China's commitment to the no first use makes them uh, to be perceived as a most responsible, the most responsible nuclear weapon state. I mean, that's a perception that the international community, at least the developing world, is seeing with China. So that probably gives room for them to continue that leadership, at least from the perception, uh, to giving or pushing for progress in arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament, because we stuck now. If we take the, the process towards NPT, the NPT Review Conference 2020, what do we have on the table? Nothing. Because we have <coughs> nothing on the table, we may see in China an opportunity to play a leadership, you say they did in climate change already, to basically open that little door that we're looking for uh, which would be considering the CTBT ratification. And that's what I say, the DPRK might be that opportunity. North Korea, uh, China being a, a, a main player in the North Korean issue, they might find a way to get North Korea to join them. North Korea showing goodwill and China showing an opportunity to open that gate that we're looking for, for progress in disarmament and non-proliferation. So in that sense, yes, I think China can and should be persuaded to do so. <coughs> So will they do it really? I mean, that's a question. Uh, I mean, the situation is such that uh, the tension, the current tension seems to push China into getting closer to Russia uh, than previously what was seen, Russia and the US, and then fearing China's, you know, as an emerging power. But now uh, China seems to be allying itself to some of the position that uh, Russia is adopting. But sometimes rightly so, if you say Russia with regard to the CTBT, we talk about transmission of data, and uh, some countries say, we believe in the international monitoring system, the international data center, but the treaty is not something that we'd want to consider. And all of a sudden we see voices coming and then saying, but how can you not believe in the treaty and wanting data from its international monitoring system? That's the next challenge for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Well, you, like me, are an incorrigible optimist uh, about the capacity to move the game forward on all these fronts, Lassima, but 
Where's the, just one final question really before we wrap up, where's the, the leadership going to come from, if not from the China in these particular contexts we've been talking about? <coughs> Do you see it as, as really possible for that, that group of middle powers that in the past, have, like Australia and previous government incarnations at least, have been very energetic supporters of the multilateral order, the rules-based order that we associate with that? Are you confident that that kind of energy can be regenerated and that it may bear fruit over time, or is it all just a pretty gloomy kind of scenario out there at the moment? No, absolutely. I'm confident that countries like uh, Australia could uh, get attraction into getting enough energy to pull the rest of the world in the direction that basically the nuclear weapon countries would follow. But it's how to do that. I mean, if I take the Prohibition Treaty, uh, the Ban Treaty, the Ban Treaty uh, seems to you know, gather enough traction right now, but is it practically feasible? I mean, that's the question that one is asking. Should a country like Japan, I mean, that Japan is seen as uh, one country who should uh, go forward uh, with regard to uh, getting uh, this world rid of nuclear weapon. But Japan is facing a situation not only with its civil society, but with the multilateral or bilateral agreement that they have with the United States and many other countries. Well, I think you'd have to be a supreme optimist to think that there's going to be buy-in to the nuclear ban treaty, which was recently negotiated, as we know, by 122 very well-intentioned members of the international community, not including Australia, I'm, I'm sorry to say. But the reason we can't be optimistic is that it's not really an operational treaty um, with enforcement and verification provisions of any, of any credibility. It's really just a normative treaty. It's setting up there in lights an objective and demonstrating that there is that support in the international community. My own instinct is that we are going to move forward on a disarmament agenda. It is going to have to be step by step around these issues like no first use buy-in and reduced deployments and reduced a launch alert and the CTBT hmm? and the CTBT in the step and by the step. CTBT in the step by step, which is no, full absolutely. circle back to where we were. Yeah. And but you know, some of the nuclear um, states talk the talk about step by step, but don't uh, show very much enthusiasm for walking the walk. So that's the task ahead of us, uh, Lassimer. It's a gigantic enterprise with the the world in the sorry condition as it is. But we're absolutely delighted to have you back in Australia. Absolutely delighted to have you at ANU and wish you every possible success in the, the fabulous work that you are continuing to do with Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organisation. So thank you, Lassima Zerbo, for joining us here at ANU.